Hey, honey. Yes, Barry? Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Where do we always go? Hasta encontrar la playa Por eso grito al mundo Yo soy de Puerto Vallarta Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Traveler Show. I'm your host, Barry Kessler, and I'm just so happy to be introducing you to my favorite vacation destination in the entire world. Maybe it's even yours. And if it's not, why not? One day it will be, and it's Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That music you're listening to is performed by Alberto Perez. And Alberto is the owner of the La Palapa group of restaurants, and it's La Palapa, the El Dorado restaurant, and at night, the El Dorado transforms into the Vista Grill, and the Vista Grill is the restaurant that used to be up on the hill. Now it has a new Vista right on the beach with a beautiful view of the Los Muertos Pier. Of course... You could always go to La Palapa and enjoy breakfast, lunch, or dinner with your toes in the sand right at the water's edge. It's so romantic. It's so Puerto Vallarta, my friends. This week, we have a pretty special show, I must say. But first, let's find out what's happening in Puerto Vallarta this week, the 31st of August, 2017. We are entering what is traditionally the slowest time of the year in Puerto Vallarta. September is traditionally the month, well, actually September and October are the two months when lots of restaurants close up and they take some time off before the tourists uh, begin coming again in November. So, If you're coming to town right now, if you're already in town, you may be noticing that some of your favorite restaurants are closing up for a month or so. Um, You know, it's a good time for the restaurants to, they shut down, they take a well-deserved time off. They've been working full time all the way up till now. So some of them take a vacation, others do renovations on their properties and improve them for the upcoming season. But whatever the case, this kind of behavior actually puts those who are looking for a bite to eat in kind of a pinch. I was reading an article written by my friend Emily where she gives this time of year uh, a particular name. It's called Septiembre. Septi for September, or in Spanish we call it Septiembre. And hombre, which in Spanish means hungry. So together, Septiembre. And she writes, a friend and I were dining together on a particular night. We were talking about how it seemed that every restaurant in Vallarta would be closed in September. We were joking we're going to starve because neither one of us knew how to work a kitchen anymore. Anyway, they figured out a mix of septiembre septiembre and ombre described their upcoming month. We're going to starve. It's going to be septiembre. Anyway, it turns out that it is already a thing. Anyway, she figures this out in her post that the locals actually call it septiembre too because these people are working in the restaurants and they aren't getting their tips and they're not getting they're not getting paid. So very interesting that she comes up with the same term that um, these the locals actually use for this time of year. So Hey, you guys get out there and tip really good Um, when you're out there during September and October. That'll help these guys out a lot. And those people that are out of work, I hope they put away some money. Um, At least, I hope they they did, okay? Anyway, I love Emily's work, and I have a link to where she posts some of her essays in my show notes to this episode of the podcast. So check that out. 
And speaking about restaurants, uh, I've heard some of you guys contacting me, and you were complaining about some of the restaurants that I review and how they only take cash. <laughs> and you're thinking, what's with that, Barry? Now look, if I go down my list of restaurants that I featured in the show, I must admit there's, 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 a, there's a few cash-only establishments here. But what have I been telling you guys? From the very start, I've always told you guys, and you gotta got to listen to Uncle Barry. T.O. Barry has always been told, telling you to use cash, use pesos. Do I have to give you guys another lesson on money here in Vallarta? Carry pesos. I never, I repeat, I never use credit cards when I pay for meals or bar tabs in Puerto Vallarta. Now, look, if you got to use one in a restaurant, I don't know why, because I've already told you, bring cash, bring pesos. But ask them if they got one of these portable scanners, okay? For me, I just don't like to risk them having my credit card in their hands, loose, loose somewhere in the hands of a server or in a cashier's hands. It's too risky. So, let's see here. Um, Chinando's is cash only. Una Familia is cash only. I think Bella Napoli is also cash only. Uh, but look, bring your pesos, you guys. Okay. Now, it's hurricane season here in Mexico, as it is, of course, in the south of the United States. So, I thought with Hurricane Harvey running amok in Texas, and you listeners in Texas, I gotta tell you, we're thinking about you, and our prayers are with you, and hope everything is, is gonna be okay. Uh, but I thought maybe I'd talk a little bit about hurricanes in Puerto Vallarta while I'm at it. So, the last hurricane to sweep by Puerto Vallarta was Hurricane Patricia. And Patricia came in October of 2015. And I was in Puerto Vallarta with my wife at the time. We were staying at a place called Casa del Puente. And actually, I have a video of the place. Uh, if you want to look at it, I'll, I'll put it in my show notes if you want to see what it looks like. But it was a pretty wild time. We didn't know that the hurricane was upon us until the evening before Patricia was to make landfall. Uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a TV set in our place. We don't really regularly watch TV. We, we do use the internet, but we, this never came to our attention. We, we came out of our apartment and we were hearing some strange sounds. And all, what we were hearing was the sound of packaging tape. The, uh, you know, the cellophane packing tape that you get in rolls. Well, we're watching all these people and they're, they're stretching and the packing tape and sticking the packing tape over all of the windows, all of the windows in the homes and all their windows on the, you know, big storefronts. And I'm looking at him and going, what the heck? What's going on here? So I asked some guy with tape what he's doing. He looks at me and he says, oh, we're getting ready for a hurricane. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> really? So we walk down to the Malacan and find them. They're all boarding up uh, the, the big, large plate glass windows on some of these shops and stores out there. And they're emptying out the merchandise from, from all of the shops, the little shops and the big stores where they were there with the trucks to haul away all the stuff to safety. And, uh, the, you know, the nightclubs with the big windows, uh, I think it was man, it's Mandela, I think is the one that's got these big, large chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. And they were trying to figure out what they're going to do to protect these suckers. You know, they're going to, they're going to bring them down. What, what were they going to do? It was very, well, all along the Malacan, it was controlled pandemonium. Uh, we headed back to our apartment because we were a little freaked out and we turned our computer on and we're looking at these news reports and it's like biggest storm ever was bearing down on Puerto Vallarta. And it's like, you're all going to die. It was crazy. It's like, 
Category 5. This is the biggest storm. It's coming. It's gaining speed and momentum. Oh, we've never seen anything like it before. I wonder if they have a Category 6. It was crazy. And I'm looking at Debbie, and she's looking at me, and we're going, Ooh, ruh row. What are we going to do? And we figured we better have a plan. So we checked out where we were, and um, Casa del Puente is right on the Rio Quale. It is on the north-hand side of the old, uh, of the old bridge. And um, so we are on this river, and they were saying there was going to be like 40 inches of rain or 20 inches of rain. And so there was going to be flooding coming down the river. And then they said there was going to be this huge uh, coastal uh, surge that was going to be coming from the other side. And we're looking at each other going, man, this is probably not the best place to be. Uh, But we really didn't know what we were going to do. So we decided we'd run out and get a quick bite. We found a place that was open to eat. I don't even remember which one it was. And we decided we'd go to bed. And in the morning, we'd figure out what to do. But in the meantime, we planned that worse comes to worse, we were going to cut out of town and take a bus to Guadalajara because I was reading some of the posts uh, on the face bags and that's what they were talking about what they were going to do. So in the morning, we woke up early. It was about 6.30 in the morning to the sound of sirens. And I looked down towards the shore and we saw police vehicles and emergency vehicles. They were going along the roads and along the beach, and they were telling everybody to evacuate. They were going up the first three blocks from the ocean. And so I said to Debbie, well, let's, let's see where the bus to Guadalajara is. Uh, they were saying that landfall was going to be about two in the afternoon. So we walked down Insurgentes uh, to the south side, and we came, I was, walked over to uh, this place looking at, well, I was looking at some uh, newspapers, and I uh, stopped to buy a paper, uh, which I still have, and if I can find it, I'll take a picture of it, and I'll post it in the show notes here so you can see uh, what, the, what the headlines were. It was all about the, the hurricane. And I saw this uh, stately-looking uh, gentleman, Mexican gentleman, standing there. So I asked him where I could catch the bus to Guadalajara. He looks at me and he says, uh, De donde eres? Which is, where are you from? And I go, Los Angeles. And he says to me in Spanish, he says, of course, he says, Go home to your family. There are planes at the airport to take you home. The bus station you're looking for isn't here. <laughs> so... I, uh, Debbie's looking at me, and she asked, well, what do he say? And so I explained to her that we, uh, what, he, what he said, <laughs> and, um, and I figured we better pack and skedaddle. So we packed really fast. I don't think we've ever packed so fast in our lives. I've never seen my wife pack that fast. I've got to tell you that right now. And uh, the property uh, caretaker was there, and she was looking for us, and she asked what we planned to do, and we told her we planned to go to Guadalajara, and asked her what she had planned to do, and she said, eh, well, yeah, probably do the same thing. So uh, we caught a cab, and we said, take us to the airport. And so the cab says, no, there's no planes at the airport. They all took off last night. There's no planes at the airport. So he says, but I'll take you to the bus station, which is near the airport. And so this is where it got fun. Um, the bus station was just jam-packed with everybody trying to get out of town uh, to get to Guadalajara. And we went through the door, um, ran into another couple that were on their honeymoon who needed some help in translating. So we really couldn't, there were lines, just big long lines to buy tickets. And uh, it looked like all the all the buses were sold out. So I went back out to talk to a taxi driver, and I asked the taxi driver how much it would be to uh, to get a ride to Guadalajara. And he says, well, it would probably cost about 300 U.S., so if you find another uh, another couple, you can split it with them, maybe 150 apiece. 
And so I'm thinking, okay, well, if you know, worse comes to worse, we'll do that. So there was that young couple there that we were with who were, who were uh, on their honeymoon. Figured maybe we could ask them. But I'm walking back in, and I hear this other guy saying, well, I don't understand why everybody is like lined up here. Uh, there's hardly anybody at the other bus station. And I go, er, er, wait a minute. And I go back over there, and I ask him what he said. And he said, yeah, over there at Vallarta Plus. So I said, don't go anywhere. So I went inside, and I grabbed the the other couple and my wife, and we hopped in this guy's cab, and he took us over to the Vallarta Plus um, Depot, where there was, you know, no big lines. We bought our tickets and got on this bus, and off we went. And we got on the road probably at about 10 o'clock in the morning, heading towards Guadalajara. That trip is usually, I don't know, it's like five hours, I think, four hours. Anyway, it was packed with people and buses, and that it took, we didn't get to Guadalajara until about eight at night. And of course, the bus is really cool. I mean, it had internet, it had everything we needed. So I was able to make reservations at a hotel in Guadalajara uh, while I was on the bus. And then when we got to, uh, when we got to uh, the bus station, we grabbed a cab and the cab took us to our hotel and we check into the hotel room and <laughs> sit down on the bed and turn on the TV set and there's this there's this guy standing on the malecon in a in a slicker in a raincoat there was no rain <laughs> and he's standing there and, the, and he's going Microphone in hand, he's saying, no wind, no rain. And of course, we're in Guadalajara, and it's raining in Guadalajara. And I'm thinking, really? Really? We spent the whole day getting out of that place, and it didn't even come? Uh. So I look at Debbie, I said, we're going back to Vallarta tomorrow morning. And uh, woke up the next morning, grabbed a cab to the bus depot, and took the first cab back to Puerto Vallarta. And um, it was amazing watching all of the all of this water rushing down the Ameca River. But Vallarta was untouched. It was pretty crazy. And uh, we got back. We called up the. Uh, the caretaker, and she met us with keys, and we got back into our place, and um, walked down the Malacan, and people were taking the boarding down, and everybody was just so happy. But it was a ghost town, you guys. I mean, everybody had been evacuated. All the hotels, they had busloads of people that they evacuated. They took them to other properties. Uh, they took them to Guadalajara. They took them inland. Uh, there were other people who stayed, and there were shelters that were set up in Puerto Vallarta, which we could have done if we had chosen to do so. And thinking back and looking back, it sure would have been nice if we had done that. But um, I'll tell you what, when we got back, it was a ghost town. We went over to, actually went to Chenando's that night and uh, sat down and had dinner there. And uh, all the churches were full of people just so happy and grateful that Puerto Vallarta was spared. Anyway, since I missed Hurricane Patricia, I thought that I'd ask JR what happened in Vallarta while we were self-evacuating to Guadalajara. And also, I wanted to ask him what it was like in 2002 when Hurricane Kenna hit. So let's go to JR right now. All right, JR, now... I just got done telling the story about what happened to me and what happened to me and my wife with uh, Hurricane Patricia. So tell us what really happened on the ground in Puerto Vallarta while we were gone. Okay. Um, I was following the, the track of Patricia as it crept up the coast and predicted quite early, actually, uh, that our mountain range the Sierra El Tuito, which is like 6,000 feet high, uh, would not allow it to pass, which is 
normally what happened with every other hurricane ever come by us. Mm. Um, what happened, in effect, was uh, Patricia took a right-hand turn and, <laughs> funnily enough, headed directly for Guadalajara, where everybody had been evacuated to. <laughs> yep, we got the rain all right. So, um, so how was it there? I mean, did you get any wind? I, I know that I was watching, and there was very little rain. Uh, yeah, zero. Yeah. Z- zero, nothing, no rain, no wind. Yeah, so the so so the hurricane of the of the century was was it was a no go. It was a total bust. Right. But, but, I mean, our big one was Kenner. Yeah. So let's talk about Kenner because oh, uh, Kenner in two right, Kenner in two thousand two um, was a Category five when it passed the bay's entrance, but several hundred miles out, um, and eventually curved in and hit some blast far north of us. Hmm. Um, but it had like a, 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 we had about a 10 foot storm surge mm-hmm. with waves on top of that. Um, and that did quite a bit of damage on the coast. Yeah. Um, but we only got a, less than an inch and a half of rain and hardly any wind. At the time, I was living in a small casita that had a laminar roof, one of those, what do you call that? Um, like a corrugated roof. Right, right, right. We call it laminar here. Um, and basically it's held down by a, a wire with a nut on top and the wire is hooked around a wooden beam. And there was some there was some good gusts coming, maybe 50 knot gusts, you know. Yeah. And I'm standing at the doorway thinking, thinking geez, I should, maybe I should, st-. And then I thought, well, but would, if, I, if I stay, I can't do anything anyhow. I mean, <laughs> the roof blows up. I can't do anything. <laughs> and all the kids on the street were running down, a la playa, a la playa. I thought, shit, man, I'll go down to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I go down to the beach by uh, Las Ocadenas Park, yeah. and basically everybody I knew was there. I mean, it was the, of course, the, the kids were playing uh, chicken with incoming waves because they were coming in, oh, a block and a half up from the beach. Wow. Right, yeah. the water was coming in, and so anyhow, and <laughs> a friend of mine drove up and said, "You want to live?" And I thought, "Yeah, hell, why not?" You know. So he's driving me back home. We're going up to see a video, and I see Steve's bar on the right hand side. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got the windows open, and I see Steve and his wife inside. And I said, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. drop me off here." The electric company had turned off the power at 10 o'clock because transformers are expensive. Yeah. And with fall, falling tree limbs and such like, you can blow them up. So they turned off the power at 2 o'clock. Uh-huh. No, 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I go into Steve and say, hey, Steve, you know, you got any ice? <laughs> yeah. Um, you want me a drink? Yeah. <laughs> he had his wife playing back in. Within an hour, the place was packed. And it was like a hurricane party, you know. We yeah, had enough yeah. ice, and, and eventually at four o'clock they turned the power back on again. Anyhow, um, anyhow, that's my Kenner story. Wow. So I also, by the way, I've got a uh, a great video with some terrific uh, clips that were uh, taken from Kenner. I'm going to put that on the website so you guys can see what this surge looked like. And you can see some of these waves were pretty crazy. I mean, they were like going up and over the millennium, the millennium statue over there next to, uh, next to the Hotel Rosita. I've got, I've got that on the video too. So you guys that are listening yeah. to this podcast, check out that video on the blog post for this episode. It's pretty cool. Uh, and my friend Ted and Gail, uh, they were here at Los Huertos, and he shot a video of the waves coming, you know, a, a block or so up onto the uh, inland. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay. I'm glad that I was able to touch base with you today. It's been a while since we talked, so thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it, JR. We had a lot of rain yesterday and uh, a little bit before, really yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw you had like, uh, what, like six inches yesterday? Uh, yeah, I think one six. Wow. And, and we had a really close lightning strike, and I'm pretty certain 
I, I took pictures, but the antenna up on the ridge across from me is missing a lot on the top. Oops. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, all right then. So are you, you seem to be getting some more rain. That's good. Um, how, is the, how is the rain for the year so far over there? It's uh, still down from what it used to be. I mean, early in the season, we didn't get very much rain at all. Yeah, I saw it's picking that. Up now, now, picking up now, but it, the seal pal still says that we don't have enough. We, we need more rain. Need more rain, more water. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on that, right. too. Right. All right, JR. Thanks for coming on with me. I really appreciate it. Okay, Barry. See you later. All right. Take care, friend. Bye-bye. Well, all right, that was a fun time hearing about Hurricane Kenna, right? Imagine playing chicken with a surf in Lazaro Cardenas Park. Wild. Okay, now listen, I have to say something. You know, that Hurricane Patricia thing, they built that thing up and up and up and up. It was going to be, we were all going to die. It was going to be the worst thing, and it never, ever happened. And did CNN or Fox News or uh, the Weather Channel, anybody step up and say, uh, oops, we're really sorry. It was, no, no, no. It was just on to the next thing. Sheesh. What a bunch of fake news. All right. Let's get to our guests, shall we? Now, Hanan and Natalie are the owners of a restaurant in Puerto Vallarta named Tre Piatti. And Tre Piatti is an Italian restaurant. And it's a real treat. The food here is so good. It is so yummy. These people really know what they're doing. And the setting is elegant, and these proprietors are absolutely charming, and they are dedicated to their craft. They're they're hardworking. They roll up their sleeves and they work every day, and open up this restaurant, and you know their customers love them. They have so many regulars, and uh, actually, I was introduced to them by Gary Beck. He raved about their food, and so I had to go try it. And then, of course, I had to talk with Natalie and Hanan of Tre Piatti Restaurant in Puerto Vallarta. So let's go there right now. Thanks for inviting me in to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So um, what does uh, Tre Piatti mean? Three plates. Uh, because we have five sections of the menu, antipasti, primi, secondi, contorni, and dolci. Uh, so there's basically three appetizers, three pastas, three entrees, three side dishes, and three desserts. And okay. the menu changes every two weeks. Uh-oh. Really? So what's the deal with that? I mean, what happens if I really like something and I, and I need it again? You just call us you one or two day, days before and we'll make you whatever you want. And on, really? Okay, cool. That's, that's nice to know. Okay, so it changes every two weeks and why is that? Um, because it's such a small menu and we, all of the cooks, get sick of cooking the same thing over and over. <laughs> and we have a lot of customers that come three or four days a week and... We want to make sure that they get to have something different every time they come. All right. That's a great plan. Mm. So, uh, all right. Tell us, um, tell me where you're from uh, and tell me what was your path to Puerto Vallarta. Well, I'm from San Francisco, California. Oh, I love uh, San Francisco. My father is from Guadalajara, Mexico. And as a young child, I've been coming to Mexico every year. And from Guadalajara, we would come here for a week or so. Uh-huh. And I grew to love it. And we both, we married here in Puerto Vallarta. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. So uh, how did, uh, and, and, and all right, Hanan, where are you from? Uh, I was born in Israel. I grew up on the East Coast and spent the last 12 years in San Francisco where I met Natalie. And we were ready to open a restaurant and we knew that we didn't want to do it there. And we knew that 
the goal was to be able to do it here and we found out it was possible and so we literally came down here each with a suitcase and started a whole new life yeah now, how long ago was that? Two years ago. Two years ago. So you opened this restaurant how long ago? Uh, in July, it will be two years. So huh? about a year and, what, seven months? Uh, so months you really got to town. When you got here, you really, you know, you were opening a restaurant. You located a place. You Right. How, how did that we work? We thought that it would take a year for us to find the space that we wanted. Um when once we got here we found an apartment we found the restaurant and started doing construction and here we are it all happened very it fast. happened very well yeah so yeah. was there a restaurant here before yes it was a like, kind of like a restaurant cafe type of it was another italian restaurant yeah. um but we did a lot of renovations it wasn't very attractive um aesthetically and we saw these beautiful trees and we saw the potential it had and we put in windows. Yeah. Okay. Here, here. describe. Yeah, describe this place to everybody here. I mean. Uh, um, well, there's two huge mango trees that have been in Puerto Vallarta for almost hundred years. hundred years. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm looking up at them right now. Whoa! One is a hundred feet tall. One is about seventy feet tall, and they produce amazing mangoes that we, are, we use on the menu and dessert. Uh, yeah, which we use in our dessert and cocktails. And I see that you have protection to keep them from falling on people's heads yes, <laughs> yes they get have, very loud we have some nets and we're actually this week even putting more nets to it so there's less bombs dropping to less disruption <laughs> yes it's right? very it's, scary it's, but they sound like bombs jump yeah. They, yeah yeah oh well that must be maybe kind we'll of fun actually, one. Right? Yeah. maybe we'll experience it is one. fun once or twice <laughs> right yeah no after but a little while when you while, don't expect it it's very yeah, scary people get annoyed yeah they don't like that well actually our customers enjoy it because because people have written um written about it yeah i mean that's and, very unusual this is a uh, these are huge and yeah. reviews yeah yeah all right. Um, let's talk a little bit about y- your training. Are you are you a trained chef? I mean, yeah. you're, you're Israeli. They're, you know, <laughs> you're cooking Italian, brother. So what's going on there? <laughs> well, I, I worked in some good restaurant, Italian restaurants in New York and in San Francisco and then went to Italy for a year. And I went to school in uh, Johnson Wales in Miami. But more, I learned working in good restaurants. Working for good chefs yeah. for very little money and really paying my dues. Okay, so you did it. You paid your dues. You've worked. Uh, you've worked the line. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Good for you. It's been over twenty years that I've been uh, working in kitchens. Excellent. Well, then you know that's great training for what you're doing right here. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your concept. Uh, what is it that you do that you do special here that you know is different from everybody else? Uh, well, like I said, we have a small menu, but we make sure there's always something for everybody. Um, in each section of the menu, you'll always find something that's vegetarian, something that's a more meat, and something that's seafood or fish. Um, this definitely the highlight are the fresh pastas. All the pastas. We make here in house and and the bread and the bread. And the bre- we make everything in house, but I think the the definitely the highlight of the menu are the pastas. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, and that's my passion more than anything else. Really, the pasta making and the sauces and everything. Excellent. Um, so you, it sounds to me you can customize dishes. Mm-hmm. You already have uh, things on your menu for vegan, probably vegetarian. Mm-hmm. You can uh, change things up for people definitely. with allergies. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with gluten-free options, yeah. gluten-free pastas with our sauces and plenty of options for vegetarians and vegans. And like I said, if there's something that uh, we're very flexible, if there's something somebody wants or to change to make it vegetarian or vegan, we're very open to do that. Cool. All right. So um, you, I know you've been here for almost two years. What is it that you like best about your restaurant? I like the, the relationships that we have with our customers. Um, a lot of them 
are from different countries, but also from Mexico, locals, um, expats. And we've just created an environment here where everyone knows each other. They're very familiar with, with our employees. It's a very family-oriented restaurant. Yeah. So it's not only about the food, it's about the environment, about the experience that you have when you walk in the door, the food. Um, yeah, I, I believe that's... Well, Natalie makes a huge effort for all the little details. So everyday fresh flowers and plants and every, you know, every day we're painting. We're, we're every, every little detail. Very visual we, yeah, and... We're, it's about the whole experience, not just the food. Well, it's a beautiful space that you've created here. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, I can see why people, you know, would come here and just just to enjoy being here, but more than anything else, you know, the, the kitchen smells delicious. I'm yeah. sure that, you know, that's what they're really here for the <laughs> food, you know. Yeah. All right. Now, you've already described your menu. Um, the kind of sauces that you make, uh, You do you do anything different? Uh, particularly different? Do you have anything that's unusual? Not a trick question. You know, you could say, no, not really, Barry. I have the, you know, the regular stuff. I have this. No, there's definitely, there's definitely unique things since we've come. We've been trying to use some of the more local Mm -hmm. ingredients. Um, I've incorporated a few, you know, ingredient, Mexican ingredients like wheat la coche, which Mm -hmm. is kind of like a corn truffle. Uh And I would never have done that in the states so i'm i think that it's it's still evolving the the mm-hmm. my food and i'm starting to try to work with some more of the chilies and and make even a more depth to these sauces and um i'm learning things even from some of my cooks that know how to make a mex- amazing mexican food and trying to maybe do some of those braises with those flavors with our pasta and so it's almost you know some dishes end up being this fusion but um, what I think is, is also special is that we're not just doing uh, Roman food or Tuscan food. Every, you'll see dishes from every region of Italy. You know, something that was important to me was to really learn um, a, lot of, a lot of the food from different regions. And that's why when I went there for a year, I worked in seven different restaurants in seven different regions. Huh. And in between it all... I would go for two days to Rome to taste food and go to Venice, and so it's really it's really a a, a vast uh, regional Italian menu, mm-hmm. which which is always changing and exciting, and and people come fr- that are from Rome, and they said I you know they feel like they're in Rome when they're eating a ro- a dish that I have that's inspired by Rome, you know. So I'm trying to make it as when I'm doing dishes that are from a certain region or from a certain city that I really try to make it as authentic as it would be there. Excellent. Okay, so talking about ingredients, have you had any uh, trouble? Have you had any challenges in Mexico getting the ingredients that you need? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. it It is out there, but it's not advertised. So a lot of the restaurant owners that have been here for many years have helped us a lot in finding good chocolate, vanilla beans. For, for me, I, I know coming from California for my husband, it's been kind of challenging because he can't use as much as you find in California. Uh, also, luckily, the construction part of it took six months instead of two or three months. Yeah. So we had this six months to really figure out what we're getting at which place and our day starts the first two hours of two three hours of both of our days as she goes and gets all this stuff from 10 different places i go to another 10 different places and get all these things and we're getting one or two things from so many different uh, purveyors and and that's really what what makes it special? I feel like a lot of we people go out here, of our are, way. you know, calling and and ordering one thing, you know, everything from this one place. But this place only has a couple things that are good, and the other things are average. So we're getting the best of the best from a lot of different places. It's a lot of extra work. Yeah, yeah. you know, we do. You have we to go. really, you have to love it. You have to be passionate about it because it's, it's it is a lot of work. Yeah, it's a real challenge. 
All right. Well, I'm glad that you were able to, uh, you know, solve those those little issues, those challenges. <laughs> Obviously, it's not too bad because right. you know you're you're producing some great food here. All right. Um, we've already talked about your menu. It changes all the time. Let's talk about a couple of fun things. Um, what? Well, let's just ask you the question that I ask everybody, and that is, for a first time person coming to Puerto Vallarta, what would be your suggestion to them? What would your advice be to someone visiting for the first time? Uh, besides coming to Tre Piatti, of course. <laughs> I would suggest trying out different different areas, whether it be in food, as in street tacos, seafood, finer dining, checking out different beaches, there's a lot of good food here. Um, you just have to search it out and just asking people, you know, where they like to go, asking cab drivers, things like that. Because mm-hmm. there's so much to see. It's such a beautiful, beautiful city. I, I feel like a lot of people see, you know, they go to stay in Nuevo Vallarta, they don't mm-hmm. really understand what's going on here in downtown Puerto Vallarta. Or they go f- to the marina, or they go here downtown, and then they don't even the come past, tracks, yeah. past the romantic zone. I think the most beautiful part of Ayrta is south of here, along the Highway 200, when you, you start getting Misma Loya, and you get to Boca de Tomatlan, yeah, and Los standing. Arcos, and and scenically, and, and... I mean, the drive is amazing. You can take the free, you know, practically free bus down right. there. But oh, yeah, it is practically yeah, free. It's beautiful. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely the most beautiful part of the bay here is south. of Only 10 minutes south of the restaurant here, 15 minutes south. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of and people the, don't get to the see The water is come. nicer, it's clearer, it's, yeah. it's bluer, you know? Yeah. More yeah. shallow, it's not so deep. It doesn't yeah. go down so deep. Yeah, nice. Okay, and doing a lot of walking around because mm-hmm. every neighborhood is very different and you'll run into people who are very friendly and mm-hmm. um, just, uh, you know, between the mountains and the ocean and the in the streets it's a beautiful place it is all right um now talk to me a little bit about um places i know we're not gonna we maybe we won't talk about dinner places let's talk about breakfast and lunch places where do you guys like to have breakfast and lunch around here you got any favorites you do um well there's what i think it's the best food is the kind of local little grandmother cooking they call it comida corrida and you so can at a really good price, yeah. and you get fifty your pesos agua of the day. It, it's yeah, that's the way to go for breakfast for sure. Or lunch. Yeah, you got a favorite one? Uh, there's lots of Danny. There's, there's so, so many. many. My favorite is, yeah. is my favorite is um, at the corner of the cemetery, which they call the Pantheon, and the and the market. There's a tiny little hole in the wall, which used to be called Avalos, and now it doesn't really have a name. Um, but it's a tiny little, tiny little place. You can go upstairs, or there's three little seats there, and there's the the grandmother, the daughter, the granddaughter. It's all a very little family-run operation. And what's nice about it is every day they do different things. Um, you you always have a choice of three or four different things, and they come with rice and beans in your water, or they have tacos that day or whatever they're doing but it's always there's just so much love put into it and it really tastes like home cooked food wow and not to be afraid of going to those places because I know a lot of people are, are afraid they're going to get sick but that's actually where the better food is at well, and the fresher yeah. and the fresher you yeah. know if they run out of it it's uh, well I ran around and did a taco tour uh, with my uh, with my recorder here so I, I, I did that last night we went I went and I spoke with all the the guys in the taquerias and i'm going you know uh, how long you been here 30 years how long you been here 50 years how long yeah. you been here 20 years and you're yeah. going dude you've been here longer than a lot of restaurants have been here you know yeah. these people have had their their taco stands in the exactly. same place in the same yeah. neighborhood for some of them 50 years yeah, yeah. so you're right you're right you gotta you gotta hit those Everybody you went to carboncito yeah, yeah, that's yeah. one of our favorites. We're mm-hmm. open till four in the morning, close on Mondays. But you know, after work, it's fun to go get a, a couple of them tacos. Near the neighborhood too. Yeah, they got that there's big, so they got so the big many. potato there at El Carboncito. <laughs> there's yeah, 
there's so many and you just have to be adventurous and try you know if you don't like it then you just have one taco and then you move on on. didn't cost you more than 14 pesos usually (laughs) exactly and there's a lot to go around there's a lot of food a lot of good food yeah yeah so why not taco hop right a couple of them there (laughs) just make sure you save enough uh, room for for tre yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) all right okay uh are you going to be open all year round you're going to be closed uh, sometime during the summer months we usually close mid-october mid-september mid-september yeah Yeah. Yeah. somewhere in the september october we'll close for a month yeah okay are you gonna go home or what do you do you stay here what are you gonna do Uh, i think we're gonna travel through mexico this year oh nice we usually go to italy for research oh yeah (laughs) and it it really helps the restaurant exactly (laughs) but um this year we would really like to travel through mexico and because we're just so excited about the food all around it changes going to puebla or oaxaca Oaxaca yeah yeah well i look forward to talking to you about that trip Maybe next time I come down here. Yeah, that would Tell be everybody good. where you're located, where they can find you, and uh, where you are on the web. Um, well, it's, so the address is 292 Lazaro Cardenas, which is at the corner of Constitucion. And a lot of people know Los Muertos Brewing with the TVs and so the pizzas and a lot of people. We're right so we're front, right across yeah, the street. Right across the street. Okay. But in the heart of the romantic zone. Good, good landmark. Okay. Yeah. And uh, are you online? Oh yeah, we have a very nice website. We have Facebook. We're Instagram. all Instagram. Trip advisor, Instagram. Yeah. Okay. So if someone wants to make a reservation. They can go mm-hmm. open table. What do they do? They call. We call. Call you. We yeah. It's it's the only way to get a reservation. It's the way to, to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Pick up For the phone. Us, yeah. Pick up the phone. <laughs> because it's a small restaurant yeah. and it's too complicated to to do it online for us. So. Okay. I think mostly because we're so small. It's it's just. Yeah. Well, you know, most, your, most of your clients control that. know how to pick up a phone and call. Right. You know, some of them don't have a computer, right? Right. Ah, no, I don't want to go. Everybody has <laughs> one around here. I'm finding that out. <laughs> well, I have to say that you have a beautiful restaurant here. I want everybody to Thank make you. sure that they come at least once during their visit, maybe twice, uh, to Trey Piotti and see Hanan and Natalie and uh, their beautiful restaurant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And such a great couple, you guys. What fantastic food they serve at Trey Piatti. Now, I spoke with Hanan yesterday, and I actually recorded the conversation, but the phone line was really bad. It was messed up. So I'll just pass along the information that he gave me. Keeping in the theme of septiambre... As we were talking about earlier, Sunday was their last night of the season at Tre Piatti. But they've got some really big plans, and I'm really excited for them. They're, they're going to be closed for six weeks, and they're going to be doing some renovations. And uh, Hanan says they're going to be making this cool chef's tasting bar. It seats up to four people, and uh, there's going to be wine pairing for a seven-course meal, and he's going to cook, and he's going to describe the dishes, and um, and the bar is made of this large slab of marble, and he said they have some special stemware that they ordered just for this tasting bar area, and it's elevated, so the people can actually see into the kitchen and watch the food being prepared. It's going to be really, really great. You know, it reminds me of a restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants in Las Vegas. They, it's kind of like a chef's table. It's so cool, you guys. So anyway, it's going to be a great dining experience for those who are going to be lucky enough to be able to make reservations at the chef's tasting bar. He says he already has the first three nights sold out. So when you do make your reservations over at Trey Piatti, keep that in mind. Maybe you want to check out the... Uh, that special tasting bar. Well, that should do it for this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. Stay tuned for more on-the-ground reports from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico next week with travel tips and great restaurant and excursion ideas. And until then, just remember that this is an interactive show where I depend on your questions and your suggestions 
about all things Puerto Vallarta. If you think of something that I should be talking about, please reach out to me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending us your message. And remember, if you are considering booking any type of tour while you're in Puerto Vallarta, you must go to vallartainfo.com, that's JR's website, and reserve your tour through him right from his website. Remember, it's a value-for-value value proposition, my friends. His experience and on-the-ground knowledge of everything Puerto Vallarta in exchange for your making a purchase of a tour that you do anyway. You're, you're just doing it through him as a way of saying thank you. Thanks, JR, for being our guide. It costs no more than if you were going to use someone else, so just do it, really. And when you do take one of those tours, email me, please, about your experiences. Maybe you can come on board and share with others what you liked or didn't like about the tour. Again, contact me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending off your message. And once again, if you like this podcast, please take the time and subscribe and give me a good review on iTunes if you would. That way we can get the word out to more and more people about the magic of this place, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And remember, I made it easy for you to do just that with each episode that I create. But if you haven't been to my website, you really have to look there. I have links to the places that we talk about. I have the interesting pictures of all these places and, and more right inside the blog posts and the show notes for each episode of the show. So check them out for sure if you haven't done that already, right? Okay. So... Thank you once again to Hanan and Natalie from Trey Piate Restaurant in beautiful Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. I have all their contact information in my show notes of this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. And thanks to all of you for listening all the way through this episode of the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. Oh, I don't want to forget. Thank you very much, JR, for coming on and talking to us about Hurricane Patricia and Hurricane Canna. All right, then. Well, this is Barry Kessler signing off with the wish for all of you to slow down, be kind, and live the Vallarta lifestyle. Nos vemos, amigos. Yeah, yeah.